certainly will be. He does equal Marquez's record. Um, and with that, the gap is closed to nine points. Uh, and also, who had a good run? The American racing team on home soil. If we just uh, go to the uh, the places just outside of the podium, Cameron Bovier was you know challenging for a podium position in the early stages and fell da- fell down to fifth in the end. Uh, but a good run for the American and good for for Moto GP and, and Moto Two to, to have an American in the Moto Two grid and scoring well uh, on home home soil. Wind it back to what we were talking about right at the beginning of this about Cota and the state of the track and the lack of funding and all the rest of it. America is America. They are really performance orientated. You get an American that's doing the business, you will get people on track side. You know, once they get behind their own people, you will see people turn out. The circuit of the Americas will start making money. It's a really strange situation, but America is, as I say, performance orientated. As soon as they've got someone, they can get behind and they can see an American doing the business. So, you know, it, it's a big deal for me. I think it's probably even bigger than than, than what it looked like because – Moto America series with Wayne Rainey behind it. You know, you saw Kevin Schwantz at the side of the track as well. I mean, Schwantz had a little bit to do with the building of Cota in the first place, gave a consultancy to the, the original team that were building the place. It all fell out at one point, but they all came back again on side in the end. Um, you know, the American racers are behind their own and they're pushing. You know, Moto America is looking brighter than it did and it's still a long way behind say the british superbike series or cv or any of those situations but they've produced bobier you know bobier i didn't think he'd be the man for this I, I i wondered whether he would be able to step make that step into where he is now it's a big environment and he was at an age really an older age than than your average newcomer into the class he's done brilliantly well um, so I think it's it's very bright for both Moto America as a series, a domestic series, and for the likes of circuits like Cota. Once once the Americans are the old banners going out there that we've got an Amer- American to get behind, they ain't had that for a long time. It was great, wasn't it? Because Bobier is a rookie, and, and as you say, Keith, he's been racing in America. This is the first time he's been on a track that he knew. So this was where we could really see, if you like, more of a level playing field with the other guys. You know, he's been going to tracks that he's completely unfamiliar with, new bike, new track, new team, everything new. This time he actually knew the track. And so to put on that kind of performance as a rookie anyway, any you know, whether you know the track or not, but certainly it showed what we can expect from him next year when he knows all of the other tracks as well. So it was a, a really great sign for the future, as Keith says, as well, as well as the present. Absolutely. And uh, a quick look at the Brits as well in Moto2. It was an issue for Sam Lowe's, wasn't there, Pete? Do we know what that was in the end? He was forced to retire. Yeah, something technical. Sorry, yeah, I don't know exactly yeah. what it was. But he said, <laughs> I think he, he said he'd been there from the start of the race, wasn't it? Right. So, uh, uh, yeah. Well, on the other hand, uh, Jake Dixon coming home in 10th. That was uh, one of his best results since Qatar, where I think he was 7th, wasn't he? So uh, a good run to see Dixon back in the top 10, Keith. Yeah, it was. Um, there's so many rumours flying around Jake Dixon at the moment. Uh, I mean, I did <laughs> ring, ring. I don't, you're the, I one, you're the, one, sp- you're I mean, the one spreading them um, all. <laughs> well, it was at the British Superbikes. The, yeah. the big deal with Alton Park was a couple of weeks ago, that um, a couple of weekends ago, was that Frankie Carcetti, his manager, who is also Joanne Mir's crew chief, um, was coming to Alton Park. You know, there can only be one reason for somebody coming to Alton Park, I suppose, in Cheshire, and that's to discuss the possibilities. There's possibilities he's got in Moto2 still. I, you know, it's all on the table, but it's all a bit kick bollock scramble, excuse my language. Um, you know, he's trying to find a career pathway and it's really difficult for for him at the moment this patronus thing is a nightmare because is he going to get it over binder doesn't look like it you know the, the situation with moto gp where is he going to go after then he's got to stay for, he doesn't want to come back he, he surely can't come back to british superbikes if he does that's him done that's his career not a bad place to be by the way you can earn money you can ride for a good team and you can go all day long in british superbikes but He's been there, done that. He needs to stay in World Championship and try and improve on where his status is at the moment. Um, so it's got to be Moto Two, really minimum for him um, next year. You know, British Superbike. He'll have a good time in British Superbikes. I, I've, the last two weekends I've spent there in that paddock, I have had a great time. Really good series, really good people, big crowds, competitive racing. You know, tracks are obviously a you know like the American series. It's they're they're a lower level from a 
an overall safety point of view. This, you know, they're as safe as they can be, and, and a lot of money's been spent on making them that way. But you come back to a frenetic, you know, competitive environment with people that you haven't perhaps raced with for a year or two, and they're all out. He's got a target on his back if he comes back to British Superbikes. Um, you know, and, and there are some very fast men in British Superbikes. So it's no, it's no foregone conclusion that he's going to come back from Grand Prix and win the British Superbike Championship. He's going to have to bloody work hard for it for years. And as a rider, I always remember what it was like for, for the likes of Neil McKenzie, Donnie McLeod, myself. We'd come back from Grand Prix back into, into national racing um, for a weekend because that's what you did back in the day. And you'd be fast, of course, because you were absolutely on your very best. You were at your best. Whatever level that was, you were at your best when you came back from Grand Prix. But all of a sudden, you get some bloke who'd ram it up the inside of you. You think, who the hell was that? I don't even recognize him. Don't know his name or anything. And, you know, you'd be in a qualifying session. <laughs> there is no quarter asked or given when you're back in a domestic series. Everyone is pushing and shoving. Um, my advice would be, and I'm sure that Frankie Carcetti is trying to force it as well, is that you stay in World Championship and try and make your um, your life there if you're good enough. And I think Jake hasn't really shown us that. I think actually Jake's got to the point, the dog doesn't agree. <laughs> I don't think Jake has, um, I don't think Jake has actually got to the point where he should get to in World Championships yet. I think he, he's, he's on, he was on the cusp and it just hasn't quite happened for him. I think there's more still from Jake. I think he hasn't made the step that I would have expected from him. I think uh, his best chance in, in Moto2, it sounds like, might be Aspar. I think that that, the, the, which was the team he rode for previously, of course. So it sounds like he's, he's got a chance to, to stay in Moto2 with them. Um, as Keith was saying, they're definitely hot. They were, there were definitely some hot rumours and some talk with BSB. I think maybe a Yamaha. Um, but it seems like this chance has come up maybe just over this, this, this Kota weekend. And that looks the, the best chance for, for Jake at the moment, probably Aspar. Um, the, the moment they had the speed up or the Bosco Scuro, they call it the chassis. Now they changed the name, didn't they? But, uh, I think it, it might go back to, um, to a Calix next year. So Calix would be good for him. Now you got on good with Calix. Interesting, the Bosco Scuro, isn't it? The speed up team, but on the Bosco Scuro <laughs> chassis, um, that we've got, but he, um, Fanati moved across. It was like Fanati has just announced that he is going to be in the uh, Bosco Scuro camp on the Moto2 bike, which I'm quite excited about, I've got to say. I think um, so he'll certainly give us some fireworks one way or another, that's for sure, because we can guarantee that from Romano. I'm looking forward to it. That's right. So he'll be returning to the Moto2 class, which he sort of got kicked out of after that two-race ban, which perhaps takes us on to Moto3 this weekend, where we've seen the first two race ban since that moment. And, uh, yeah, I think we, we all understand why. <laughs> yeah, it certainly does. Pete, you're ahead of the game there. Um, but we are running out of time, so we will move it on. I'll just round that off in Moto2, and because it, it was, of course, uh, Ralph Fernandez uh, ahead of Fabio Di Antonio and Marco Pazecchi. Standings-wise, it is now just nine points between the top two, so that really sets us up for a really great finale for Moto2 and Pazecchi with 260 six points in third uh but yes let's turn our attention to moto three and i mean where do you start if you're listening to us or you're watching us it's more than likely you know exactly what's happened and you've seen uh the incident we will be focusing on here at the end of it all it was isan guevara who was claimed the winner uh, ahead of Dennis Foggia and John McPhee on the podium, but it was not a uh, simple way of getting there, was it? Uh, Keith, <laughs> let's start. I think we've got to start with with the incident, haven't we? Your thoughts on it, because, I mean, it involved Acosta, Minya, Alcoba, and it's deemed to have been caused and very much looked at the time by Dennis Onju, who has, as Pete has just said, received uh, a ban for two Grand Prix. Your thoughts on it? We're in trouble, aren't we, with these smaller classes? You know, it's across the board. We are, I mean, and it's percolating across the world as well. Again, into British superbikes, in the support classes that are there. You've got youngsters on equal machinery. You know, there seems to be, I, I, I kind of seem to remember being slightly dismissive of Pete's education um, comment last time round when we discussed this. Probably unfairly now that I think about it. After, after you put it there, because, I, I, you know, I was a young rider once and I really enjoyed a fight. There's no doubt about it. It's bloody good fun, pushing, shoving, that, that 
instinctive maneuvering that you do as a youngster on a bike you're ahead of the game you're you're learning every single yard that you turn um but maybe there is more to it than 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 what i'm thinking because it's it's happening everywhere at the moment the the racing is so close the bikes are so close in performance the riders are so close in their abilities there does need to be another dimension here race bands yes of course i think we do need race bands i think that that's the only way you're going to really really impress upon a a a serial offender is to to ban them and i think find the team as well because if you penalize the team financially um they all feel it it's then some of you know once you've got a bit of skin in the game a bit of money in the game um, it's going to cost them as well as losing points, as well as not having their rider out there. You know, I don't know what the substitution rules are when somebody's been banned. I think you can still bring another rider in, can't you? So it's, uh, it's I think you can, um, because otherwise it affects the show, and Dorna are a hundred percent against affecting the show. Um, <laughs> although, of course, conversely, we are affecting the show by having youngsters um, killed and and injured. And again, this weekend, really, really lucky not to have someone hurt in this this incident. Um, it kind of stumbled its way to a result in the end with a, just a few laps in the end. We had a straight sprint race at the end to, to get to where we got to. And well, hey, John McPhee managed to avoid all the carnage. Um, normally someone knocks him off or, or gets him involved in, in their accident. So McPhee on the podium, brilliant, really happy for the Scott. But the wider issue is you've got to be draconian. There, you know, Somewhere along the lines here, there have got to be uh, maybe, um, you know, Pete will, will expand on maybe, and I know you will do, uh, expand on that idea of education. Okay, let's let's talk about education. How can we educate these kids? You ain't going to be able to keep telling them, you know, it's like if, if I tell my kids what they should do, <laughs> there's no chance. There's yeah, absolutely no chance. I mean, exactly, and I would agree with that. The last thing you want is people like a headmaster talking to a, a bunch of pupils. Yeah, I, I would phrase it more as advice. So I would take people like, almost maybe the current MotoGP riders, some of those guys, the most experienced guys in the class, and get those guys to talk to them and go, look, when you're in a pack, this is what happens. This is what you need to watch out for. This is what you do. This is what you don't do. And this is why. And and that kind of thing that just might maybe, you know, we always hear about riders being caught out when they get a double slipstream, for example, because they just, they weren't aware that that's what happens. And suddenly they get sucked into the braking zone because they they haven't been in that group slipstream. Maybe they've done testing as a rookie. They've done testing on their own. Suddenly you're in a race, you're in a pack of riders, that kind of thing. Um, I think the, the trouble is, Pete, these guys are experienced from CEV, from rookies, from CIV. You know, they do have that race crafting experience. But what they are doing, and they are prepared to put it on the line at a very early age. I think that the, the kind of – I think they do have the tools to be able to do that. I think that you're right in having a more experienced person in advising them. I think there needs to be – not just there needs to be a package, doesn't there, Pete? I, I think there needs to be a, a packet, a performance package that 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 makes a Moto Three bike less happy in a slipstream situation. You need to find that particular technicality that that will make it not such an attractive package in that. And that could come down to gearing. I think penalty wise, we need perhaps I think I mentioned it before. Maybe we get a, a rev penalty for someone that's involved in it. So they are taken out effectively. They're still in the race but they're not going to be fighting for the lead if they've lost 200 revs or whatever it might be dialed in through the electronics, through the ECU. Um, I think that they need a meeting in the morning and one in the evening of every day. I think it's almost like a situation where a reminder, a refresher. Now then, this is what happened last time. You did this, you did that. Yeah, you know, private. It has to be obviously private and behind. You know, it's not not like you've got to pick on people for performing, which again is something that, that can happen. We're dealing with kids at the end of the day. You don't want to undermine them. Um, you want them to perform to their very, very best. But I mean, how do you make motorsport safe? At the end of the day, when someone is hit by another motorcycle, and that's really the thing that causes the the, the most devastating of injuries. There's very little legislation you can do about that. There's not much you can do. You can slow the bikes down so riders have a split second more to see what's happening around them, in front of them, and so on. You know, if you're approaching something at 145 miles an hour, um, it all happens. You know, someone will be able to work it out for me, I'm sure. It'll all happen a lot quicker. It, 
obviously, than if you're approaching it at 90 to 100 mile an hour. Will it make the racing any 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 worse? Probably not. Um, but I always think that's more like a a national come international kind of uh, rule that needs to be done. Moto three is a Grand Prix class, so we come back then to the overall answer for me is you don't have anybody under 16, maybe 18, in the Moto3 class. They have to stay back in the National Series until they've done their kind of apprenticeship and we get to the actual Grand Prix at a certain age. I think maybe trying to get kids to act responsibly on a motorbike, on an international racetrack, when you've got thousands of people watching you and cheering you and you're earning money and you're getting big trophies and standing on podiums, I mean... It's intoxicating. It is an incredible. I mean, what kid wouldn't do everything he could? I, I just, I just find it, uh, it. It fries my brain thinking about it. And I'm sure there's a lot of fried brains down in MotoGP at the moment. I mean, how they can try and mitigate this disaster that we've had this year with three kids being killed. I think specifically, just looking specifically at this incident. So what happened was that that uh, Onchu slipstreamed past Alcoba. And then, to use the words of the penalty, swerved across in front of him. Now, there's no excuse for that. You know, yes, they're kids. They can make mistakes under braking, overtaking, tapping other riders. But they need to know you can't be swerving on the straight. There's no... Perf- but Mark Marquez has done that year on year in his early years, taking up that area into a braking point, into a braking area. Marquez, had, you know, slipstream gets alongside, and then soon you just move you over onto the white line. I've seen it times. It's Many, many top riders have done that. Um, but I see where you're coming from. Yeah, so that's what, but that's maybe, what, maybe that was that what I was just going to say, is that half the grid have done this. You know, that's the point. This shouldn't be like, this is Dennis Onchu, and it's only, this is, you know, he's the only guy that's ever made this mistake. Pekka Banyaya said, you know, look at Rodrigo at Barcelona on the straight. He was doing a similar thing. The, the surprise really is, why wasn't this clamped down on sooner? You know, they should have done this sooner. They've, they've let, once you let people do that kind of thing and not be punished, all these young guys learn, don't they? They learn, right, that's the limit. I'm going to push right to the limit then. If, if you're going to let people do that, that's what I'll do. And I think they have drawn this line in the sand. It was interesting, the penalty mentioned an email that had been sent to the teams and riders. So I think that they had warned them, look, things have changed. We won't tolerate this. And that was, you know, that wasn't, that's not normally in the penalty. Normally, I mean, the penalties are brief anyway from what we get on the public side. So this was unusual to see that this went against something that, you know, information that had been sent to the teams in an email. So they'd obviously been warned, presumably after these, these tragic accidents that we've had, that they would be clamping down on, on conduct or dangerous, aggressive riding. And so, you know, it's no surprise. But I think no surprise that this two-race ban has been given. But I think, why, you know, why wasn't this done sooner? Um, but there we are. They've drawn a line now and, and you know, let's hope I'm, I'm things not, improve. I've not been party to, to, the, to that letter. I've not seen it, to be honest with you. But, I mean, I think that, it, that there is a point there that we've sort of skirted around. The, the, the overtaking and then moving across to take the line, um, you have a similar rule in cars, I think, Harry, where you can make one move going down into the, the braking area. Um, I think we should have no move. If you are on the inside, on on the, if you've just passed someone, you can't cut across the nose of someone. I think if it's specific, and it's penalised accordingly. But again, how often is that a the overall problem? It's not. It's just one of um of many um, manoeuvres that you see in the smaller classes. The word respect. I just, I, I mean, I, I wouldn't want to be the man that had to sit on any kind of committee to try and work this through. It is a, it is a very very difficult subject, which is why I think a raft of of, of different penalties, a raft of recommendations regarding the technicalities of the bikes, and obviously the education thing, Pete, that you you quite rightly have brought to our attention last time we discussed this. I, I mean, just just to say, where, what I had in mind, and you, you would know more about that, is that the rookie system for the Isle of Man TT. You know, when when people go to that race for the first time, I think I've, I saw a TV documentary. I think it was, and and they get taken around in the course car by a more experienced rider, and they're shown that that was basically what I was thinking, that kind of system where you have someone just trying to take out the obvious errors, shall we say, of, of, of riders when, they, when they're when they doing something for the first time. But, yeah, as you say, so, people... Sorry, I'm smiling and I'm not being flippant, <laughs> but I just had Cliff Richard in a red bus going around the Isle of Man with all the new riders with their orange jackets <laughs> singing, we're, we're all going on a summer holiday. Sorry. <laughs> 
But you're right. Yeah, you know, Milky Milky Quail, who is a local man to the TT, obviously knows it absolutely backwards, and he does, and he takes the rookies round and advises them on on corners, what can catch you out, on places like that. I mean, I don't know whether you've ever been around the TT course, but I mean, I think the first mile, and I was already I was already dead on my feet when when I did the first. You know, there's so many things there to try and take in, but probably not a bad idea in reality because you know, again, it's getting kids to listen. It's got to be a, a combination of things. I mean, I think let's throw it open. Let's see what anybody watching the Crush Crash dot net podcast has to say. What are what you know? What are your observations? Because quite often, out of nowhere, other people that are maybe a little bit further removed from it than we are can come up with something that makes quite good sense. And you go, oh yeah, that's quite a good idea. I quite like that. And we'll pass it on. Yeah. I mean, I still deal. I still talk with Mike Trimby at Erta regularly. You know, and I know that they are so concerned. At the image situation as well as the the the, the life situation that, that they've got with with kids being you know there have been people that have been killed in in grand prix over many 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 years it's been minimized a lot over those years but um when you've got you know three kids in different categories you know related to the ladder to where we are at the moment it's it is a devastating situation and moto three has been a little bit a little bit loose for a little bit long, hasn't it, really? I mean, I think they've allowed things to get away in qualifying, in practice. You know, th- th- there are rules there, and, and they do get used, but it, it almost seems like that example that I think you were looking for, Pete, needs to be made. It needs to be much stricter. Um, and that might then filter back down through the categories that that um, are racing below Moto3 that will be feeding... Moto three at a later stage. Absolutely, no. what a horrible I, subject. I know. Well, it's it, but you know it, we could it could have been worse this weekend. We could have been very easily talking about you know the fourth young rider uh, to have died this year. Thank the Lord we didn't. But uh, at the same time, it just once again highlights the ongoing issues. And you know the word respect was brought up a lot across the broadcast this weekend. Does that come under the education banner? Is there an inherent lack of respect amongst the young riders when racing each other? Do they not feel the fear that perhaps they 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 should have a little bit of? So do let us know in in the comments your thoughts on this uh, on YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, Crash dot net and Crash Net Moto GP. Just have a look for that. We are very rapidly running out of time, but I think that was. Uh, we have to, have to absolutely um, give that the time of day. Let's just talk about um, the final actual results, which were declared from uh, before the first, where the first red flag was flown, uh, if we get our heads around that. And it was, despite having actually ended up sort of retiring from the race in the final sprint, it was Guevara who took his first win after a very stroppy outburst in the garage once he uh, came in when his bike uh, uh, basically... Uh, died and then Fodger in second and John McPhee on the podium he was in the lead though wasn't he on for a win in those final sprint races but uh, uh, a, a good podium there Keith what do you make of it? McPhee's a great experienced rider and he will have been making the most out of out of what he got at the time I mean the circumstances around it at the end of the day you can only do your best with it and I think that was where McPhee was at I mean you know avoiding that situation is you know Crucial. I mean, I'm happy for him, but I mean, the circumstances of the race at the end of the day were were difficult. I think. I mean, no, yeah, it's good to see him on the podium. I think that's as far as I go with that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it was the first win for uh, Guevara ahead of Foggia and McPhee. Foggia takes 12 points away from Acosta, who does still uh, collect the points for eighth place because, of course, we go to uh, count back where they were before the red flag so it's now 30 points between Acosta and Foggia for the top of the standings Garcia uh, in uh, third as well um, and that just about does it I think for uh, our uh, MotoGP podcast this week thank you so much uh, for your company and Keith and Pete as ever always a pleasure uh, to listen to your wonderful tones we've got a little bit of a break well MotoGP has at least a couple of weeks until we go back uh, to Misano and to avoid confusion they've, they've of course named it the Emilio Romagna Grand Prix uh, from the 22nd to the 24th of October. We'll be back then and we will be back before then as well um, to 
fill the gap that you may otherwise have in your schedule. So don't miss out. Make sure you're subscribed in all the usual places, YouTube, uh, Google Podcasts, Android and iTunes, Apple, wherever you get your podcasts from. Leave us a review. Uh, If you like the podcast, stay up to date with all the very latest MotoGP news on Crash.net. And from all of us, we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.